As you return to your seats, would you open your Bibles with me to Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16. Our sermon text for this morning is Deuteronomy 12 through 26. That, that is chapters. Um, this is the longest section of text. We're taking a Deuteronomy chapters uh, 12 through 26. It's, it's not standard for us always to preach 15 chapters at a time. Um, but we are this morning, and one of our commitments as a church is to preach expositionally, meaning that uh, whatever point or points are made in the sermon, we want to be able to show that we think this is the message of the text. So we try to uh, make points and then show you that we believe this is coming right from the text. So we don't come up with something and then try to find something that fits it, but here's what it is. This can be done at a broader level or a smaller level. In the smaller level, a few verses, you try to preach and make a point and show the point in the text. You can do the same thing at a larger level. And so we, this is not a departure from uh, our exposition of the text, simply a recognition that if your approach is always simply to take a few verses as your sermon text, you will simply never work through the whole canon. And so our commitment has been to do that. And so sometimes we take broad strokes, as we've done through the book of Deuteronomy. We'll also do in the next uh, section as we look at the books of 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles. And if you want to know why we would take that in broad strokes, simply read the first nine chapters of 1 Chronicles. <clears throat> when you realize that it's one long genealogy, you'll say they should take this in less than two sermons. So we will look at uh, this morning at Deuteronomy chapters 12 uh, through 26. But for the public reading of God's word, I, I simply want to read chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. So would you stand and hear the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. You shall offer the Passover sacrifice to the Lord your God from the flock or the herd, at the place that the Lord will choose to make his name dwell there. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat it with unleavened bread, the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that all the days of your life you may remember the day when you came out of the land of Egypt. No leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory for seven days, nor shall any of the flesh that you sacrifice on the evening of the first day, remain all night until morning. You may not offer the Passover sacrifice within any of your towns that the Lord your God is giving you, but at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make His name dwell in it. There you shall offer the Passover sacrifice in the evening at sunset, at the time you came out of Egypt. And you shall cook it and eat it at the place that the Lord your God will choose, and in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. For six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a solemn assembly to the Lord your God. You shall do no work on it. Would you remain standing as we pray? Father, help us now. As your word is preached, I pray that you would help me to preach your word not in, in the wisdom of man. I acknowledge I, I have very little, but even if I were to have wisdom, Lord, we do not need to hear the wisdom that man can give, we need a demonstration of this power of the Spirit of God. So, Lord, help your word to be preached in the power of the Spirit. And we also pray that you would help us to hear. Lord, we do not take for granted that our ears would hear accurately, our eyes would see the glory of your word, our minds would understand, or our hearts would be moved by it. But we pray for these things. By your grace, enable us to hear and see and delight in and love and obey your word this morning so that our lives might then as we go out be offered as living sacrifices to you and that be our act of worship. Or do all that you desire for our good and for the honor of Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sins, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, 
to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the, those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. Now, you'll recognize that, perhaps if you didn't know the reference particularly, you'll recognize that as a reference, a quotation of Hebrews 7, 26 through 27. As we hear that, it, it resonates with us, doesn't we understand it? We, we understand that this is a description of Jesus' work as our high priest, the one who would represent us, who lives on our behalf, who, who lives to this day so that he might intercede for us, who, who offered himself as a sacrifice for us. Not only do we understand it, but our hearts are moved by these truths, aren't they? There's a reason why we could sing the lines we did earlier and find our hearts moved when we said, Before the throne of God, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and intercedes for me. The reason that moves us is because we understand the imagery. We understand that it's had an effect on our standing before God. But just imagine for one second that we didn't have the Old Testament. Imagine for one second that we didn't have those books that when you begin your annual Bible reading plan, you typically get stuck, stuck in Exodus, Leviticus. Imagine those books weren't around. Then would we be moved by the line we sang earlier? A great high priest whose name is love. I don't know how we could be moved because I don't know how we would understand it. You see, it's simply impossible to understand the work of Christ apart from how it was revealed to us in the Old Testament, how it was foreshadowed. Now, yes, we acknowledge the sacrificial system, Aaron and his sons taking one goat and, and sending it out into the wilderness to represent uh, the taking away of our sins, and, and another goat being slaughtered and its blood shed to, to show us that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. We understand that that system, that priesthood, was not our final hope. We do not say Aaron and his sons are our Savior. We do not say the sufficiency of the shed blood of a goat is why we have forgiveness of sins. We know better. We know that they're types and shadows. We know that Jesus Christ is our Savior. We know that He is our hope for forgiveness of sins. But we do recognize that apart from this system, apart from the Old Testament foreshadowing and providing for us the framework and categories in which Christ came and performed His saving work, that without these, we simply could not make sense of what Christ did as our high priest, offering Himself as a sacrifice for our sins, could we? Shedding His blood so that we may not be forgiven. We understand that the Old Testament provides types and shadows of the person and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But it's not simply the person and work of Christ that the Old Testament also foreshadows. It's not simply hard to understand the work of Christ, apart from the Old Testament. The Old Testament also provides types and shadows concerning who we are as God's people, the church. I would dare say that a people of God, especially for Him, is hard to understand if you don't have the Old Testament. And not only does it, does it foreshadow God having a people, but the nature of who we are. And one of the place, places in the Old Testament that we see quite clearly a, a picture of who God's people are, who God's covenant people are to be, is in Deuteronomy chapters 12 through 26. Now, if, if you read the text this week, or since it was 15 chapters over the last couple of weeks, if you read the text this week, one of the things that you'll know is that these chapters are simply made up of a list of, of varied commandments. I mean, it's just a quick survey through the text. If you take your Bibles, turn to chapter 12, and let's just quickly run through it. If, I'll, I'll note simply the, the headings that, that you'd find if you have a pew Bible, like uh, the one I'm preaching from this morning. You'll see in chapter 12 a reference to God choosing a place to worship, worship here and not there. The end of the chapter, a warning against idolatry that stretches on in through chapter 13. In chapter 14, <coughs> excuse me, you pick up with clean and unclean foods. The Israelites are allowed to eat this food, but not that food. In chapter 15, a commandment about the sabbatical year, a year that would happen every seven years. You would do these things and not those things. Uh, chapter 16, the celebration of the Passover. As chapter 16 goes on, you have a number of feasts listed of booths and, and tabernacle, forbidden forms of worship. 
chapter 17, laws concerning uh, legal matters about judges and priests and also laws concerning the kings. Chapter 18, uh, notes about uh, provision, providing for the priests and the Levites, abominable practices. Moses talking about the coming of, uh, of the office of the prophet, ultimately being fulfilled in Christ, we understand. Chapter 19, laws concerning cities of refuge. So that if you commit a crime and it's accidental, you shouldn't be punished by death, but you could go be protected in this place. Property boundaries, laws concerning witnesses, 20 laws concerning warfare, 21 atonement for unsolved murders, marrying female captives, rebellious sons, rights of the firstborn, a uh, man hanged on a tree is cursed, chapter 22, various laws, chapter 22, laws concerning sexual morality, chapter 23, those who should be excluded from the assembly, chapter 23 as well, uncleanness in the camp, followed by more miscellaneous laws, chapter 24, laws concerning divorce, chapter 24, again, more miscellaneous laws, Chapter 25, laws concerning leveret marriage, so that if a man was married to a woman and he died, his brother should then step in and marry her, so that his name is not lost. More miscellaneous laws at the end of chapter 15, and then in chapter, or chapter 25, and then at the end of chapter 26, offerings and first fruits and tithes. Now maybe, quick run through that, gives you a bit of relief that we're not taking 15 weeks through these chapters. But I think it also reveals these laws just fell all over the place. How do you piece these together? But one of the things you'll note if you read through these 15 chapters, as varied as the laws are, as vast as the landscape is, there are some threads running through these chapters, some phrases, some ideas that are just repeated again and again and again. And when you take these ideas, these threads, and you put them up next to each other, one of the things I think you see is that the Lord is sending a clear message as to who His people are. You see, these laws, these commandments, may feel arbitrary, but they're not. Everything contained in these 15 chapters is saying something about who God's people are. And one of the things that you find when you turn to the pages of the New Testament and read about the church, the new covenant people of God, one of the things you realize there is these themes right here that we're going to see this morning are present in the new covenant as well and therefore true of us. So what I want to do this morning is simply note four elements that you can trace through these 15 chapters that identify the nature of the people of God in the Old Testament and will help us understand who we are and who we are to be as the people of God in the New Testament as well. So with that said, I'm going to put every one of these points simply applying to us. As God's people, we. I want us to understand this is true of us as God's people, but I'll first show it to you to be true of Israel. So first, I want us to see this. As God's people, we're never to forget the Lord's redeeming work for us. As God's people, we're never to forget the Lord's redeeming work for us. Now, I've already showed you places of worship, cities of refuge, abominable practices, marrying female captives. The laws are all over the place. But one thread that comes through again and again and again is the call from God to His people to remember they were redeemed from Egypt. Look at chapter 13, verse 5. This is in the midst of, uh, of telling them... Um, not that the prophet should not teach rebellion against the Lord, he says in verse 5, but that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death, chapter 13, verse 5, because he's taught rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. You see the reference right there in the midst of it. God is the one who brought you out of Egypt. You are the people who have been brought out. Just go down a few more verses, chapter 13, verse 10. Again, a command to execute the one who has committed great crime and tempted others to do the same. Verse 10, you shall stone him to death with stones because he sought to draw you away from the Lord your God. Who, who are you, Lord our God? He tells us, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Chapter 15, in verse 15. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this <clears throat> today. 
Now, for the sake of time, I won't continue to read the others, but you can note this is repeated throughout chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. Chapter 20, verse 1, 24, verse 18, 24, verse 22, 26, verse 8. If you want all those references, they're here in the manuscript, and they'll be online. But repeated throughout, and especially emphasized in the text we open the sermon with, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8, an entire meal is to be celebrated annually for the purpose of remembering their God is the one who brought them out of Egypt, and they, as God's people, are those who have been redeemed out of Egypt. And this concept of God being the Redeemer and Israel being those who are redeemed out of Israel, out of Egypt rather, seems to be the foundation for numerous things. Sometimes God will bring it up in order to say, therefore obey my commandments, or therefore do not rebel. Sometimes he'll bring it up in order to say, therefore have compassion. If the sojourners in your land, treat him with compassion. Why? Because you once were a sojourner in Egypt the land out of which I have brought you. Sometimes he brings it up in order to tell them they shouldn't fear man. If you're going into battle, you're going to take on a, another people, but do not fear. Why? Because I'm the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt. I brought you out of the hands of the world power. Who are the Hittites in comparison? Sometimes he brings it up in order to tell them uh, why they are to give offerings. Why give offerings? Because you're giving an offering to the God who redeemed you out of the land of Egypt. But regardless, again and again and again, they're told to remember. And the question I have when I read this text is why? Why? In the midst of various commands, various laws, why is this one repeated again and again and again and again? And I think the answer is this. The redemption of Israel out of Egypt by the hand of God is the identifying trait or, or the, the identifying marker of God's relationship with Israel. That if you, want, if you want to say, what is the essence, what is at the foundation of God's relationship with his people, the answer is, he is the one who redeemed them out of Egypt, and they are the ones who have been redeemed. So think of it this way. Let's think of God for a second in this Israel-God relationship. Who is God? Well, all the world should recognize he's the creator. I mean, the Egyptians are walking on ground that God created. They're using uh, resources to make bricks that God created. They're looking up at the moon that God created. They're looking at the river that God created. They, they should recognize him as the creator. All the earth should. All the earth as well should, should acknowledge God is not only our creator, but he's the one who sustains our life, keeps our hearts beating, who, who brings the, the seasons as they come. He's the one who sustains life. He's sovereign over the creation. But to Israel alone, they recognized God is not simply creator. He's not simply sustainer. He's the one who redeemed us out of the land of Egypt. Other peoples could not say that, could they? Israel said God is the one who redeemed us. That's who he is. Or think about Israel. In some ways, they're very much like other nations. They're made up of people. They have certain customs, certain traditions, certain laws, certain places in which they dwell. They have leadership, government, if you will. But what is unique about them is that unlike every other nation, they can say, we were redeemed by God out of slavery. So this idea, this commandment to remember God as the Redeemer and Israel as those who have been redeemed out of the land of Egypt becomes central in them understanding who they are. And this idea of that idea of redemption shaping the relationship between God and his people doesn't simply disappear once you get past the first five books of the Bible. In fact, if we were just to walk forward in the biblical storyline a little farther, we would find out that Israel does go into the promised land, and while they're in the promised land, they rebel against God. And true to God's promise... He removes them from the land. He scatters them. The imagery God uses is this. He said, you are all like sheep, and my shepherds, my kings, my leaders of the people, they have been wicked. One of the things we're going to see in this text is uh, the Lord uh, says to them, if you come into the land, in chapter 17, starting in verse 14, when you come into the land, if you want a king like the other nations, that's fine. Only let them not take many wives or much money. Man, they got it wrong right off the bat, didn't they? I mean, every one of Israel's kings went the wrong way. So the Lord says, uh, my, my shepherds, 
that I put over my people, the kings, they have acted ruthlessly and, and wickedly, and my people, like sheep, are going to feel that my hand of judgment is coming down. And the imagery God uses is, my hand of judgment is coming down on the land where my sheep dwell, and my sheep will be scattered all over the face of the earth. That's his judgment. And true to form, God drove them out of the land all over the earth. But the Lord made a promise. It's interesting how it's worded. The Lord makes a promise throughout Ezekiel. If you, if you read the chapters and throughout Jeremiah, if you, if you read the chapters, sometimes he says, I myself, I myself, I'm going to come get my sheep. I myself, I'm going to come and, and gather my sheep from all over the face of the earth. And sometimes he says, I'm going to send my servant David, a man. He's going to come and gather my sheep from all over the face of the earth. So, so the question you begin to ask then is, okay, God... Are you going to come gather your people personally? Or is it going to be a man? Because it seems like you're saying two things that, that are contradictory. Not only does the Lord say he's going to do this, but he declares something else. In Jeremiah 23, verses 7 and 8, the Lord says this idea of you thinking of me as the one who's redeemed you and gathered to myself, it's going to change but even as it changes, the idea is going to remain. Jeremiah 23, verses 7 and 8, the Lord says, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. God says, no longer are you going to talk about me in those terms. Whew. So is the idea of remembering God as the one who redeemed us gone? Nope. But instead, it's going to be replaced with something else. Instead, you're going to say, as the Lord lives, who brought up and led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven them. God said, I'm not saying you can stop remembering me as the one who redeemed you and gathered you to myself. I'm simply going to do it in a different fashion. At one time, I brought you out of Egypt. Now I'm going to bring you out from all the countries of the earth. Now, there was a time, if we continue reading the Old Testament, where Israelites were able to leave the place of exile, and some of them came back to Jerusalem. But it, it feels like it falls way short of God's promises. For one, God himself, or this man, coming and personally delivering his sheep to himself, it doesn't seem to happen. But when you get to the pages of the New Testament, you begin to see the answer unfold. Jesus of Nazareth comes along, and who is he? He is God the Son incarnate. That is, he is both God and man. He is the God-man. Coming to fulfill this promise, and Jesus even takes up the language. What does he say in John 10? I'm coming to gather my sheep, and my sheep will hear my voice, and they will come to me, for I am their shepherd. Jesus is the David to come, and he is God himself coming to rescue the people. He is the God-man. And he makes clear that he is not coming simply to gather people who make up a national geogra geographical people, political people, Israel. Rather, he says to them clearly, I have sheep that are not of this fold. That is to say, I have my people who are not Jews. Rather, it will be Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, men and women, boys and girls, all over the face of the earth, who will place their faith in Jesus Christ. They are the true Israel. They are God's people. And so Jesus comes to gather them. And indeed, he does, gathering people, both as he is here calling the twelve and others to himself, and then after he ascends back to uh, the Father's right side, sending his Spirit into our hearts, so that we as ambassadors for Christ go into all the countries of the world, to all the ends of the earth, bringing Christ's sheep to himself. And what does Jesus do then, right before his death? This act of redeeming his people. He shares a meal with them. A meal that prior had always served the purpose of remembering God's redeeming work out of Egypt. But what does Jesus say? He takes the elements of the meal, and instead of saying, this is to remember the night that I brought you out of Egypt, this is to remember the night I redeemed you from slavery, he rather takes the bread and says, this is my body given for you. This is my blood, the cup which is shed for you. Jesus takes this meal and says, listen, the idea... Of, of remembering me as the one who delivered a people out of Egypt is gone. 
This is not your hope and your focus to think back to Egypt as if that's your hope. To think back to your redemption, your physical redemption there as if that's my work. No, 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 no. But the eye of redeem remembering God as our Redeemer and we as the redeemed is front and central to who we are. Rather, he fashions the meal and says, from now on when you have this meal, you're to remember me, Jesus of Nazareth, and what I have done to redeem you. You see, the concepts have transformed, they've progressed throughout the redemptive storyline of the Bible, but the central element of remembering Jesus Christ, the God-man, remembering our Lord as our Redeemer and we as His redeemed people is still central. And it becomes the very identity marker of who we are in Christ. Yes, all the world should, should recognize God as Creator. Revelation 4, they praise God because He created the world and everything in it. But in Revelation 5, they progress from that to where the Lamb is front and central, declaring that He has purchased for God a people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. Jesus Christ and His redeeming work is central. And so when we gather, we gather and yes, we acknowledge God as Creator. But more importantly, we acknowledge God not only as our Creator, but the one who has redeemed us in Jesus Christ. This is why talking about the redemption, the redeeming work of Christ, singing about the redeeming work of Christ, reading about it and praying about it and remembering it at the table is, is just central in everything we do because this is central to who we are. If you want to know who Christians are, if you're an unbeliever this morning, you've come and you've thought to yourself, why in the world do these people take up and, and lose half their Sundays gathering to hear a lecture. Why in the world do people get up even on Daylight Savings Time Sunday and come and gather? Why do they live weird ways? Why do they do weird things like put people in water? Bring them up out of water. That's important to know. Bring them back up. <laughs> and the answer to this is because we are those who have been redeemed by Christ. It's central to who we are. You want to know who believers are? This is our central identifying marker. We're those who know that Jesus Christ came and lived and died and rose so that, rose so that we might be forgiven of our sins. Redeemed from, from the bondage we experienced being bound by Satan and sin and death. And He brought us out so that by faith, He's forgiven us of our sins. By faith, he's, he's redeemed us and made us His own children. We long for others to, to know this redemption as well. We long for others to place their faith in Christ. But if you want to know who we are, that's central to who we are. That's why it's central to everything we do. But there are implications from that relationship. Just as there were implications for Israel, as God's redeemed people, certain things must be true of them. Though for us, as God's redeemed people, something that we must never forget and work hard to remember, there are implications of it shape who we are as well. And so the second thing I want you to note in the text is this. As God's people were to be holy and to treat threats against our holiness seriously. As God's people, those who have been redeemed by Him, were to be holy and were to treat threats against our holiness seriously. Now you can see early on in the chapters that, that, that Israel is called to be holy. Chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. The Lord says to Israel, You are the sons of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves or make any baldness on your foreheads for the dead. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for His treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. If you end, then, our section, going to chapter 26, verse 19, you'll see he very much ends on the same note. We can start in verse 18 of chapter 26. And the Lord has declared today that you are a people for His treasured possession, as He has promised you, and that you are to keep all His commandments, and that He will set you in praise and in fame and in honor, high above all nations that He has made, and that you shall be a people holy to the Lord your God, as He has promised. Now the idea of holiness, I think, is most easily understood. It's, it's most elemental understanding is this. To be holy 
means to be holy, by, by this I mean entirely, W-H-O-L-L-Y, to be holy, H-O-L-Y, means to be holy or entirely devoted to the Lord. You want to know what holy means? That's its basic meaning, to be wholly devoted to the Lord. So, so the Lord himself being holy carries with it the concept that God is wholly devoted to himself. He is his one who exalts himself, who makes much of himself. When he commands us to be holy, he commands us to, invite, to, to delight ourselves, to center ourselves, to make the object of all of our affections and the entirety of our lives about him. Now, what can be confusing to us about that is that that doesn't feel loving. But it, but it is. The reason it doesn't feel loving is because we're used to me and you, aren't we? So say that I said all of you should make your entire existence about me. Being obsessed with Lee Tankersley. Making your affections in right here with me. That would be very boring, really. It's very hard. There's just not much to me, right? Um, so it would be selfish. Why? Because if I tell you, make your life about me, there are a hundred trillion to the infinite power, whatever, things that are better than me that you could delight in, that you can make your obsessions about. So for me to say, D devote yourselves to me when there are all those things that are much better than me, that's selfish. But what if you're God and there's nothing better than you? There's nothing more glorious than you because you're infinitely glorious. There's nothing that can bring anybody more pleasure than to delight in you, than for God to say to us, delight yourself in something other than me would be unloving. He would be saying, be content to delight yourself in something that's less satisfying than me. Be content to, to delight yourself and obsess your life in something that is less glorious than me. But God loves us more than that. And so he tells us, you're a people that I've brought to myself and I want you to be holy. That is, I want you to be entirely devoted to me. You're set apart for me. And that is the most loving thing God can do. So when he tells Israel, you're holy and you're to be holy, what he's telling them is to devote yourselves to me, which obviously involves them obeying God's commandments. And when they obey God's commandments, one of the things that that's going to do is it's going to make them distinct from all the other peoples of the earth. None of the other peoples of the earth live like God's people. So, so we could see just a, just a quick run through of, of some verses here. Uh, chapter 16, verse 21. Chapter 16, verse 21. You shall not plant any tree as Asherah beside the altar of the Lord your God that you shall make. You shall not set up any pillar which the Lord your God hates. Now, why would he tell them about this? Because this is what the other countries do, but not God's people. They're going to be distinct. When they obey God, they're not going to look like the other countries. Chapter 17, verse uh, I, I've already made reference to this in verse 14. He says, if you want a king and have a king, only he shall not look like the other kings. Verse 16, chapter 17, verse 16. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver or gold. You can have a king, but you're still going to look different. You're going to be distinct because he's going to obey my laws. Chapter 18, verse 10. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering. Anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or sorcerer. Why talk about this? Because that's what the other nations did. We could go on. Chapter 22, verse 5. A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Now this seems like a great idea in all times and all ages, doesn't it? But apparently, this would likely have been something that was happening in the other countries. And the Lord said, not my people. They're going to obey my commands and be different. Chapter 25, 
verse 16. For all who do such things, all who act dishonestly, are an abomination to the Lord your God. Other peoples may act dishonestly, my people won't, declares the Lord. Not only are they to be holy, i.e. wholly devoted to the Lord, therefore obeying His commandments and looking distinct then from the other cultures, but they're to treat threats against that seriously. If something would lead them to turn away from God, well, they're to take it seriously. One reason why God commanded them, when you go and take on the other armies, wipe them out. Devoted to complete destruction. One reason is so that the people would not be able to continue and turn Israel's heart to obey their abominations, to worship their gods. Look at chapter 20, verse 16. Chapter 20, verse 16. But in the cities of these people that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, you shall save noth alive nothing that breathes, but you shall devote them to complete destruction. The Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded, that they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable practices that they have done for their gods, and so you sin against the Lord your God. They're to take threats, to, to pull them into sin seriously. In fact, one of the things that you'll find again and again and again, and it, it just seems odd to us, is these consistent commands. If somebody does this, execute them. If somebody says, hey, let's go on into sin, he's like, you shouldn't follow him, you shouldn't befriend him, you should kill him. Right? And it happens again and again and again. And there's one phrase that, that we'll read throughout the text again and again and again throughout these 15 chapters, and the phrase is this, so shall you purge the evil from your midst. You'll find that in chapter 17. 2 through 7, chapter 19, 11 through 13, chapter 19, 18 through 21, chapter 21, 8 and 9, chapter 21, 21, chapter 22, 20 through 24, chapter 24, 7. Again, for the sake of time, I don't want to show you all of those, but they're there. So, they're to be holy, wholly devoted to the Lord, obeying His commands, which are going to make them distinct, and treat any threats against their holiness Seriously, all the way to the point that if someone would lead you astray and tempt you to go into sin, he's to be executed. Okay. Now when we think about us, here in the New Covenant, not under the Mosaic Covenant, this can seem very odd to us. One, we don't have a king, aside from Jesus Christ. We don't have a, a king, one of us, that reigns over us, so, so that law seems weird. We're not to go about murdering everybody that tempts us. We should correct them and instruct them. Don't kill them. There are no prescriptions against what we can eat. All foods are clean. Praise the Lord. But one thing that remains is that we as God's people are to be holy. In this way, the old covenant people of God give us a perfect type and shadow of who we're to be. We're to be a people who are holy. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 explicitly says... Be holy as the Lord your God is holy. God's devoted to Himself perfectly. You devote yourself entirely to God or to be a holy people. That involves us obeying the Lord's commands. Remember the Great Commission. Jesus Christ, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you to do. So everything Christ has commanded comes to us and we obey. And when we obey, it's going to make us distinct from the world around us. So in a, in a culture where there are loose sexual morals, it's believers who, who, who argue that, that, that sexual intimacy should, should only be uh, found, should only exist within a marriage between a man and a woman. That seems weird to the culture. To suggest to a culture that you should keep yourself sexually pure and remain a virgin until married is, is, is laughable to them. It's normal for the Christian. That's not super-Christianity, that's just Christianity, right? We're to obey the Lord and therefore we will be distinct to, to a world around us and a culture that is grabbing for the more and more you can get. We give, and we give generously, and we joyfully do it. And it's not simply rich believers who believe. I mean, even the rich pagans give. All believers, we give and we love doing it. It's, it's, it's who we are. 
in a culture in which self-centeredness dominates. We're those who, who reach out and care for widows and orphans, don't we? It's, it's who we are. We look to exalt others and make much of them. Why do we do it? Because Christ has commanded it. Why does it make us distinct? Because Jesus Christ is showing to the rest of the world, these are my people. And when they obey me, they're going to look differently from those who do not obey Christ. And we're to take threats to sin, threats against our holiness, seriously, aren't we? Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, if your hand would cause you to sin, cut it off. If your eye would cause you to sin, pluck it out. It's better to, to avoid hell with one eye, than to go there with two. And what does he tell us in 1 Corinthians 5? In 1 Corinthians 5, if you have a member of the church who is walking in unrepentant sin, he doesn't mean a member in the church who's struggling with sin, that would be all of us. But a member in the church who is walking in unrepentant sin, that is, they refuse to repent of their sins, he says you actually remove them. And, and there's so many reasons for this. For their good, one of the reasons is, though, because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. If you have an individual who's walking in unrepentant sin and the church says nothing about it, you've created a dangerous environment. In fact, I taught New Testament uh, class at, at Union, uh, night class a couple semesters ago, and, and, and one of the things I said as we got to 1 Corinthians 5 is, what's worse than a church where a man commits adultery is a church where a man commits adultery and nobody says anything about it worse. Why? Because what you're allowing to do is that to poison the entire congregation thinking that's acceptable practice. But a man commits adultery and he repents. It's sending the message that there's forgiveness. When we walk in holiness, it sends the message that's good. So, so in fact, Paul not only commands us then to remove an individual from the membership of the church who's walking in urban sin, but his last phrase in 1 Corinthians 5 is this. Purge the evil person from among you. Where do you think Paul's getting that language? I think it's from right here in Deuteronomy 12, 26. So we're to be a people who remember that we've been redeemed and not forget it. We're to be a people who are holy and treat threats against our holiness seriously. And then third, as God's people, we're to care for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, we could just say this implicitly based on the command to be holy. My logic goes like this. If I'm commanded to be holy, then the pinnacle of holiness is love. In fact, if I loved God perfectly and I loved my neighbor perfectly, I would fulfill every one of God's commands. You would too. Problem is we don't, and sometimes I deceive myself as to what love looks like, and so I need laws. I need to be told sometimes not to associate, not to chase after sexual morality because my mind can deceive myself enough that I, I don't understand that's unloving. But the pinnacle of holiness is love, and holiness is always a corporate idea. The commandment of the Bible isn't for you as an individual, be holy and don't care about anybody else. In fact, that by definition is being unholy because one of the commandments of the Bible is to love your neighbor as yourself, right? Right? So if I, I'm looking up for my holiness and, and I don't give a rip about my neighbor, that's not being holy. So I could simply say implicitly, since we're commanded to be holiness and love the pinnacle of holiness, and holiness is corporate, therefore we should love our brothers and sisters in Christ. But we also see it explicitly commanded in the text. Throughout these chapters, the Lord continues to come back to the fact that the Levites are not going to inherit the land. They're not going to get an inheritance, but the people of God must care for them. But not just the Levites. Look at chapter 14. Verse 28. Chapter 14, verse 28. At the end of every three years, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it up within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, who are within your towns, shall come and eat and be filled that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. Now this is one example. He also tells them to care for their brothers when they become poor, to make sure your son gets an inheritance, even if, even if he's the offspring of a woman you're, you're not, you, you don't love, you've taken a couple of wives, and to build a barrier on your roof so that people don't fall off of it. 
If, if, you, if somebody makes a loan and you keep their cloak for collateral, give it back to them at night so they don't get cold. There's all kinds of commands that just command them to love and, and care for one another. And what's interesting is there is to be a special love for the Israelite. So, for example, chapter 23, verse 19. Chapter 23, verse 19, you shall not charge interest on loans to your brother, interest on money, interest on food, interest on anything that's lent for interest. Verse 20, you may charge a foreigner interest, but you may not charge your brother interest. That the Lord your God may bless you in all you undertake in the land that you're entering to take possession of it. You see, the idea is, yes, do good to all people, but especially to your brothers and sisters. Now, when you get to the New Covenant, we find the same reality as there. We're commanded to love, aren't we? Love our neighbors as ourselves. We're commanded to especially love God's people. Galatians 6, 10. As there's opportunity, do good to all people, especially to the household of faith. We don't have many, as many explicit commands as to how to love. I mean, Deuteronomy is filled with if you're in this circumstance and this happens, do this and not that. I mean, we don't have as much of that in the New Testament. But I think the way that we are to look at these multiple explicit laws is something like training wheels on a bike. A number of the explicit laws were given, I think, in the Mosaic Covenant so they could serve like training wheels, so that they could serve to just a model to provide for us a form of what love looks like. In the New Covenant, there aren't as many explicit laws about loving your neighbor. Many explicit do this in the circumstance, not this. But it's actually ratcheted up. Because what you find in the New Covenant is the idea that even if something is lawful, even if it's okay to do, if it would in any way harm your brother, don't do it. In fact, always seek what would be most loving for your brother and sister in Christ. This is the drive of the New Testament. In fact, the, the great thing about corporate worship is that all through the week I can worship God. I can worship God drinking a bottle of water, worship God eating breakfast, worship God doing my homework, whatever it is, I can be worshiping God. But on Sunday mornings, I get the unique opportunity to worship Him in a way that I can edify other brothers and sisters in Christ, a whole bunch of them. One of the glories of corporate worship is that we get to love by edifying one another, that it's not simply me and God. It's me and God and His people together. So as the new covenant people of Christ were to love, to pray for, to serve, to seek out ways to edify one another. And then finally, as God's people were to come before our Lord with rejoicing. As God's people were to come before our Lord with rejoicing. Now, if I were to tell you that the people of God in the Old Covenant were to bring offerings, uh, animals and otherwise, to the Lord, and I were to ask you, imagine what their demeanor or mood should be. It might be interesting. I mean, think about it for a second. What should their mood be like? You're about to bring an offering to the Lord. What should their mood be like? Now, remember, He's a holy God. Remember, He is, he is awesome. Remember that when God spoke, the Israelites couldn't even listen to his voice because they were afraid they would die from it. Remember that he's the God that when Uzzah touched the ark, Uzzah died. He's the God who said, if somebody leads you to rebel against me, execute him. Stone him with stones. So when you're coming before that God and bringing your offering, what should your mood be? What should your demeanor be? And perhaps surprisingly, the answer again and again and again in these chapters is, you should come before Him with rejoicing. Now, since we're running out of time, I'll simply make reference to this in chapter 12, verses 10 through 12. You'll hear this phrase, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. Chapter 12, 17 and 18. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God in all that you undertake. Chapter, 20, chapter 14, verses 24 through 26. Eat there before the Lord your God and rejoice. 16, 11, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. 16, 14, you shall rejoice in your feast. Chapter 26, 10 and 11, and you shall rejoice in all the good that the Lord your God has given to you. In fact, look at chapter 26. Something really interesting here. In this section, the Israelite is to say to the Lord, I've not sinned against you. And he's to lay out all the ways that he has not sinned. And listen to what he says in chapter 26. 
Well, look, look, go back to verse 13. Then you shall say before the Lord your God, I've removed the sacred portion out of my house. Moreover, I've given it to the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow, according to your commandment that you've commanded me. I've not transgressed any of your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. Now he's going to go on to more that he's done to obey the Lord. And here's what he says in verse 14. I have not eaten of the tithe while I was mourning. Why would he say that by way of talking about the right tithe? I've not eaten this while I was mourning. The reason is because the Lord commanded when you bring the offering, you rejoice. We find this in the New Covenant as well. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 and Philippians 3, 1 both tell us rejoice in the Lord. Philippians 4, 4 and 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 say not only to rejoice in the Lord, but to rejoice in the Lord always. Now is mourning appropriate? Yes. There are a number of individual lament psalms in the Bible where the, the psalmist is by himself lamenting. There, there, there are also some corporate lament psalms, even times that, that the people of God all together would find an occasion where they need to mourn together. But it seems that the predominant theme of our mood before God as we come to Him in worship is rejoicing. And I think there's a reason for that. One, the Bible commands us, Romans 5, 3 commands us to rejoice even in our sufferings. First Peter chapter 1, Peter says, We rejoice even though for a little while we're grieved by various trials. So there's actually explicit commands to rejoice always and all times, even in suffering. But also, I think there's this dominant idea that regardless what there is in this world and in this life that brings us trials and troubles and suffering, what is always true if your faith is in Christ is that you have redemption. Therefore, sometimes even with tears rolling down our faces, we need to find ourselves looking to redemption and rejoicing. Sometimes even in the midst of our pain, we need to find ourselves rejoicing because our eyes don't ignore the pain, but they also, while looking at the pain, also look above beyond the pain and recognize that when I had my deepest need, Jesus Christ came and lived and died and was raised for me. In fact, it's so important that we remember redemption and therefore rejoice that Jesus gave us this meal. So that every time we gather, we may not lose sight of His redeeming work. Yes, even if we get together in a time when our community collectively is mourning and gather on a Sunday morning, one thing that we can't do is ignore what Jesus Christ has done for us. And He's made it so that we can't ignore it by giving us this meal. And so this morning... As uh, we close our service, we're going to come to the table eating of the bread and drinking of the cup as way of remembering our redemption, remembering who we are so that we might live holy, so that we might love one another, and so we might rejoice before the Lord in worship. If you're a non-believer this morning, I plead with you to place your faith in Jesus Christ and to profess that by baptism. If you're already a, a believer who's already professed his faith in Jesus Christ and you're a member of an evangelical church, we want to invite you to come to the table with us this morning. We're going to take a moment of silence while the ushers and musicians come forward. Then we're going to distribute the bread and the cup, remembering what Jesus Christ has done for us on his cross. And then we'll eat and drink together. So let's take a moment of silence now as we prepare to come to the table.